più forte di solito ma tanto questo è solo per registrazione quindi lo tenere anche basso poi lo regola lui adesso vai guarda metti questo qui perché se no se si mette a muoversi poi cioè si sì, ce l'abbiamo un buon altro perfetto sì. no so perché i video hanno dell'audio e... il video dici l'audio lo lasci cioè l'audio ora sarà funzionato immagino che sì adesso quando mi vado a vedere a controllare di là se mi danno l'ok Vado? Ok, grazie. Sorry. Vado. Ok, so welcome uh, back. I hope you had a nice uh, and intense uh, weekend of study. And, uh, Thank you, thank you very much. Is the sound okay? Can you hear me? Okay, good. So I know, you know the rules better than I do. Please sign. So today will be a lecture a little bit different from the following ones. Uh, we'll try and spend some time in understanding what reinforcement learning is about, why it could be interesting, try to get a sense of how it works, and so we will face general questions. So the format today will be rather peculiar. It will be highly interactive. Uh, so it will also be an experiment, because I've been doing these things in different contexts with different audiences. Uh, we'll see how it goes. From tomorrow, it will be back to pain level 100%, okay, with mathematics and all the things you have to do, okay? But for today, we just want to have more discussion and interaction, okay? So let's start by watching a short clip, okay? So I, I just ask you to pay attention uh, to this clip, and then we'll see. That's a very surprising move. I thought you thought it was a mistake. Hmm, I think it will be a little bit of a surprise. I think it will be a little bit of a surprise. I think it will be a little bit of a surprise. I think it will be a 现在呢，大家更多的去尝试呃，以前都没有下过的一种下。嗯、也希望更多的人来关注围棋，嗯，喜欢围棋，借助这个阿尔法狗电脑，围棋也是。我们古老的这个文化的一种瑰宝吧，算是啊。我觉得这两者结合是一个呃非常有看点的一个东西。Okay, then next I will show you recent news and views from Nature. That's about a paper out for print in October 2017. So I would just like, want to attract you, your attention on a couple of sentences. I will read them out for you because probably the font is too small for read to read. 
So this is an artificial intelligence program called AlphaGo Zero has mastered the game of Go without any human data or guidance. And then I will go on to read this short part for you. How well did AlphaGo Zero do? There was a roughly an order of magnitude improvement in most of random numbers compared to the former version, AlphaGo, uh, that defeated Lee Sedol. So it's a 5 million training games rather than 20 million, three days of training versus several months, and a single machine with four tensor processing units rather than multiple machine, etc. The new version, AlphaGo Zero, without any human data or guidance, beat the former version 100 to 0. Okay, so who has an idea, a general idea of what this clip was about and what this paper is about? Please raise your hands. Okay, very good. So now you will group in small groups, say five or six people, uh, make sure that in every people there is at least one person who has raised the hand now, okay, who will act as a facilitator for the following session. So once you form this group, so please move, make a mess around, change faces, switch faces. The purpose of these small groups is to confront each other and ask questions. So the outcome, the output of this short five minute session will be asking questions. So what do I know? What do I think I, I've seen? What, what I didn't understand? What are the challenges? Why this thing is relevant? Questions. You don't have to come up with knowledge or answer. If you have some knowledge, you can help facilitating the discussion, but you have to come up with questions. Okay? Five minutes from now. I will move through. Are you organized? No, 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 you have to organize yourself. Uh, we don't know anything. That, that's the point. So you don't, nobody, nobody. No, nobody. nobody. Matteo? Non ce ne sono due o tre in fila adesso. Poi quando sono finiti stacco il, stacco il microfono. Loro non hanno nessuna idea, puoi guidarli nella discussione. So he's gonna facilitate the discussion. Is there, is there any group? So question. Question? Excuse me, your attention a second. Excuse me. So are, are all your groups set? Is there any group who is lost in space without any guidance? You are? Good. I am alone. You're alone? Okay. Please form a group over there. I will provide a facilitator for you. No, no, I am. You are a facilitator. And then gather someone else over there.
All right, please, please your attention, okay, so don't, if you, so if you have joined some, some other group, don't disperse because you will be asked again to gather in the same group as before, right, so try to find your chairs, move around, try to organize yourself in order not to be shuttling ever, for all time back and forth. Okay, so now we will go through all the groups asking for, for input or feedback from you. Uh, so let's start from, there was a group here. There's a one, one spoke person per group. Of course, the others are free to, uh, to add uh, more information. So, yeah. so this is different from chess. You could go in points to get some so, sorry, just, just, just a second. Uh, I'm asking the technician if you can have a microphone so you can be recorded as well. Can we have a microphone, please, or I just I use my, my one? I know they, this one. I'm not sure it's what is it? Is it? Keep this pressed? Yeah. Okay, now it's worked. Okay, could you please? Okay, so from what we understand, this is different and more exciting than a computer learning how to play chess. Computers knew how to play chess for a long time now. But chess is different from Go. How? Chess is, I guess by understanding, some kind of deterministic game. You have a set of initial conditions, some moves that you, can, you, know, that you have no choice but to play. And by following those rules, you can get to your final desired outcome. That is to say, getting checkmate or stalemate or whatever. I think those are the only two options for winning. Um, and a computer used to be able to learn how to do that by just repeating, 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 practice, 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 learning all of the possible outcomes, and then just playing them. It couldn't do that with Go. Now, I've never played Go. I've just learned, apparently, the rules of Go, that in some way it is more of a kind of Markovian game. Does that seem correct to people who know about Go? Okay. So, yeah, and the whole point of playing Go is that you can create some kind of bridge from one side to another by placing the your color wherever you want, and being able to connect the dots uh, in whatever pattern for the end, and that's your condition for winning. Okay, so does all this description make sense to all of you, or who was sort of lost in space again still? So it's about, let's, let's go back one step, simpler things. So it's about one, 
computer program that is able to play a difficult game. Okay, so that's the baseline of the discussion, and it's a, it's able to do that at such a level that it's largely outperforming humans in this task, especially in this second generation. Okay, so anyone from your group wants to add something, some command? No. So please pass on the microphone to the next group. Yeah, the thing we observed that this computer learned without any human data. I mean, it excel in something far to the humans without any input from humans. Okay, so this is already an, an interesting point of difference. Uh, in the first version of this program, AlphaGo, uh, which was the one who defeated uh, Lee Sedol, in which, which who is a world, world champion in this game, uh, uh, this was heavily trained with examples. So just the computer was receiving many, many, many Go matches, and then looking at this example is sort of based its knowledge. In the second generation, this AlphaGo Zero, the recent one, there is no such input. The computer is just given the rules of the game, so it doesn't perform moves which are not allowed. All the rest is just self-teaching. What's that mean? Can you speak up? Self-play, okay, self-play. Self-play, repeated games, starting from very low level and then going up all the way. And it took only, you see, it took only a few days to go up to a level where he mastered an enormous ability. Okay, ne next group. Um, yeah, the questions that came to mind were precisely what data the machine uses to, to learn how to play. Because, well, there's a an exponential number of moves, so there's no way of learning all possible moves. And as regards the reinforcement, the only reinforcement is win or lose at the end of the match. So That's very good. This is already pointing to, to some key issues that we will look into in great detail. So there are two big problems arising here. The first one is how to represent the chessboard. So what does the algorithm see? It cannot just have a list, a table of all possible configurations. They are way too many. They are already too many for chess. Okay? This, it's astoundingly large number of configurations that you have. So it doesn't work that way, and that's the first problem. And the second problem is it's difficult to build upon this process of self-play because the outcome actually comes only at the end, when you win or you lose. Okay? So the signal that tells you you've been doing bad or good comes only after the end of a very long process, which requires, as all of you play, who play a game, requires planning, requires forecasting. Okay, how does it really do this? These are good questions. Please uh, pass on the microphone. Where's the microphone? Oh, please. But just just ask a question, then you'll move the other way. Okay, so we in our group we okay we said also the same things, that okay, without rules, just with a probe, just with a process of self-learning, he was able to, the program was able to teach himself to play Go and beat any machine or human in the, in the same field. So with the rules of machine learning. So the question is actually, yes, how can be devised an algorithm which is able to, call, to create and gather data from itself and then build them without any influence of the external world into a winning algorithm. Okay, so that's basically a slightly uh, arranged version of the same question. So how can these things actually be done? So that, that, that will be the purpose of this, of this two weeks course, okay? Understand the basic, no, no not, the, not the nitty gritty details of how to type this hard, but understand that the ideas that lie behind that allow this progress to be made. Please move the microphone top. I am okay. Thank you. 
Um, is it possible to extract this learning from the machine, or it's like uh, hidden in uh, a set of uh, neurons or, and so on? And is there any uh, symmetry or, uh, let's say, different scales in the Go game? Or um So the question is, uh, if I can summarize it, correct me if I take it wrong. Do we understand how the machine thinks? Yeah, and is it possible? F I mean, it's yeah. possible for us to exactly decode to what, what it, it's yeah. doing. Because uh, then, uh, for physics, it could be okay. something. Uh, so, uh, I can provide an answer. So, rough, very in very rough terms. Okay, we to a degree, we don't understand in full what the machine is doing. Okay, much of the process by which decisions are made it is obscure to us. Also because it takes place in some yeah. abstract space which we don't have the intuition to, to understand. But this could be much told for many of the actions that humans make, right? It's very difficult to understand why you came to certain decision. It's a complex uh, thing. Here, really, we don't. sometimes we don't understand the language uh, that the machine is using. And this is a problem, potentially. So there are projects, ongoing projects, about what is called transparent AI development. So development of artificial intelligence, which is understandable by humans. And it's, it's, a, it's an interesting issue. A little bit more on the futuristic side, so make building up safe artificial intelligence, one that we can understand dialogue with, uh, uh, without any machines that are just big black boxes we do, which do uh, things that are not really understandable to us. To a degree, we, we can do it. Not all of, not all of it. So that, that's provisional answer. Uh, as, as what regards the, the question, we un, do we understand what they do and can we decode it? I, I would just attract your attention by playing back this initial part of the movie. When, so in the light of this question, uh, this, this was a meeting between Go players and machines. Uh, they say that the machine is transformed the way humans play. The machine now is teaching something to humans how to play. Which is something that shows that some things that happen in the machine are That's cool. a very surprising move. <laughs> I That's a very surprising a move. So this is a very nice shot. I, I will just play it again to explain the context. So during the game of the first machine, AlphaGo, there were two expert players who were commenting, okay, looking at the chessboard, the moves that machine does, and then reproducing them, and look at the expression. So this one is not, I mean, it's not a world champion, but it's one of the greatest experts about Go in the world. And he looks at this and is really surprised. And, it's, and actually what he does, it's not shown in the video, is that he's reproducing the move on the, on the chessboard, here on the magnetic chessboard. It moves this, and then looks at this and then puts it back again because he can't believe his own eyes that the, the, the AlphaGo had made this move because it was totally surprising. Okay, it was a move that no expert player would have played in that context. So the machine is doing something that if not only we have a hard time in the coding, we have also another time in, in, in intuition why it's doing that. And this is also transforming the human play at this level. Can you please? I just one thing that came to my mind is uh, what do we uh, teach the machine when we say that we have taught, like in the previous version, we taught some set of rules. Uh, I mean, rules we already teach even the second version. But what was the extra information that was there for the first version? So for the first version, it's just like you have a, a book of many, many games which are played. This is where usual for chess, many, many uh, situations, et cetera. And then we're just feed, fed into in the computer. So the computer knows the development of many, many games knows who has won in the end, right? So it, it's, it's a strongly, in the jargon, supervised part of the learning which takes place, which is absent from the second uh, part. But then as someone said, there are exponential possibilities of, like possibilities, then we can only teach a finite number of... Uh, That's what we were saying before. Pieces. There's no hope and, and these machines don't do that. They create like we don't. Do. We, we, when we play chess or Go, we don't just have one configuration and say, okay, from that configuration, I compute, I plan, etc. You have an overall view, a strategic view, which of course wipes out many, many details and leaves room for many, many errors. Uh, 
but you have a, a sort of compact, compressed representation of what is, what's happening in the chessboard. We have one. Sometimes we can explain what we see on the chessboard. Sometimes we can't. The machine has another. And we will discuss how to construct this eff efficient representation of a, of a world which is too large for us to be encompassed into a single simple table. I just have some questions. Uh, the first one is, uh, is any special rule for the corners or not? For any the corners. For the, oh, now you're asking a question about Go. I, I don't know. Don't, <laughs> I don't know the okay. rules of Go, I admit. <laughs> OK, OK. Please, can you, can you tell us? Do you know how? Sure, sure. Could you, could you pass on the mic? He can answer for you, I hope. <laughs> OK, so, so I used to learn to play Go when I was young. Uh, I got amateur four done. What, uh, these guys, these professional players, are uh, professional nine dons, which is the highest level of go. So uh, I just want to make a remark of what you were just talking about. So I think one really important thing of of Af or Africa brought to us is that you make a lot of like a lot, a lot of moves that was nonsense to us to to what I've learned from go. So the move you just showed to me from a, from a goal player's perspective was, was okay, it was, it was unexpected, but at least I can tell what it's doing right there. But a lot of uh, moves made by the later version of AlphaGo, it was just totally nonsense. For example, one of the favorite moves of AlphaGo is called 3-3. Three, three. Um, when I was learning Go, my teacher told me that that is the worst move you could possibly move, make in the beginning of the game. And that's the favorite move, AlphaGo. So, well, I think like AlphaGo really, I really think that AlphaGo is the single most important event in the history of Go. It just like it brought so many new things to us, and all the professional players now are studying uh, the moves of AlphaGo, and they are trying to you know um, form a completely a new understanding about the game. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for this. So, but there was a technical question you can answer in, in my place. What was the question again? Uh, about the rules of the corner, that was yes. the question, and and some other questions. I, I don't know I'm able to ask them or not. Yeah. Are, are they all about Go? Yes. <laughs> okay, so you can address them directly to him. So, uh, <laughs> And probably separately, because the, go, the goal of, of all this is not to learn about how to play Go, okay? okay. <laughs> but just to take it as an example, I, I, would, be, I would be failing miserably. Uh, but it's about taking this as an outstanding example of what machines can perform at a human level and how they do it, etc. Okay, so yeah. you can address directly. Yeah. Sorry, Thank what's you. your name? Uh, what's your name? Uh, Chris. Chris, you can ask Chris all the details. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. How uh, much your question? Uh, you told that in 30 days it was able to beat one champion, right? With 30 days of training. That's what I read. Yes, I already forgot. But uh, three days. Ah, three days. Okay. So, is there a limit for that? I mean, if it keeps on training itself, is there any limit uh, up to which that machine can learn? It's a hard question. I don't know how to answer. It should be should provide probably a metric for this. So, is it improving? Is it ever improving? In what in what sense? I, I can't hear you. Is it the question? Is is you have to provide some metric for this so to know whether it still keeps on improving? Like a ranking of LO rating for. I think most of us have heard about uh, machine learning, but the question which is really important for me that uh, AlphaGo Zero learned from itself, so it played with itself only with the rules given. How? Uh, what about uh, learning physics? Can it publish something? Because it's really important for science that nowadays uh, we have see a lot of phase transitions because of having machine learning, but uh, we haven't seen them before. 
So if we give, for example, all the rules, uh, I mean the physical rules and condensed matter to it, can it publish anything? Or can it really learn in the sense that we do uh, everything? Does, can, it, can it learn anything? Or there are some limits on the way that it can learn? Because if it can publish, if it can learn, so what's the purpose of us here? Okay. These, these are existential questions. And uh, of course, they are very important. I'm not uh, putting them aside. They require an entire different direction of discussion. So first of all, these are questions about what, what it means to be to learn for us, right? Again, it's again, all these questions, first we have to face the general question is what is intelligence in general before get asking questions about what can artificial intelligence do? So what is intelligence? Is it the ability of just collecting information and coming up with answer? Is something more creative? Is there a, a gap between what machines can do and humans can do, or it's a continuum? So everybody can have his own opinion at this stage because basically we don't know, right? Uh, so these are all legitimate questions. For the specific point of condensed matter, yes, this, these things are already on their way. So people is extensively using machine learning in order to classify materials, new, finding new materials, exploring. So this is something that already exists. Uh, on the more general setup, it's an interesting question. If most of you are interested, we can organize uh, another discussion like this on more on existential issues or social. No, I mean, I'm serious. This is something that I'm very much interested in. So if uh, you are interested, just uh, we, we can find some time later in the week or next week in some afternoon to, to meet again and discuss like this uh, all together about uh, social, political, jury, jury, sorry, uh, legal uh, and uh, uh, ethical and um, existential issues about artificial intelligence. But for now, we just keep on the more uh, sort of mathematics related part of it. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, concretely, how does this algorithm work? It's like a neuronal networks or? Um... Uh, if, if, I'm, if I tell you now, then I can go home and uh, the course is over. <laughs> That's exactly what we're going to do in the next two weeks, OK? Uh, any further questions, comments? Yes, please. Then move it on the back after. So about the uh, the surprising moves, uh, can we consider them some of them like uh, like a way to deceive opponent or human? A way to deceive. 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 Oh, oh yeah, that's interesting. Yes, um, might be, might be. Uh, in fact, there are there is an entirely emerging notion of adversarial learning. Okay, uh, so might be that it's it, it's one thing in 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 a more general. I don't know. I don't know for for this again. Like I said, I'm not go expert, so you should ask Chris for this. Uh, but uh, uh, it might well be that it's in the uh, in the benefit of a long range, uh, long term reward is doing things that are apparently. Uh, Negative. This is something that happens very often, when, especially when the rewards are very much delayed, as we will discuss. So here and then there. Uh, one of the biggest differences between AI and the animals is between, that usually... Between, sorry, I can... I can. A, a difference between AI algorithms and animals is usually AI algorithms need large amount of training data to learn, while animals just need few experiences. But here we are dealing with something which uh, trains on self-produced data. So can be can this way of self-teaching uh, be an answer to the problem of learning from uh, a small amount of data? OK, so first of all, I would say that the comparison between AI and animals is a bit unfair, because animals have been around for millions of years for training. OK, so it's not training that occurs during development or during their lifetime. It's, uh, there's also a lot of training which has been going on through evolution. OK, it's a different kind of training. It's different kind of algorithms. But when you compare what animals can do with what machines can do, you have to account for that. You have to discount for what all evolution has provided animals with in order to go for their goals. 
right? And then on the other side, there's a plus to artificial intelligence in that the rate at which experience can be collected is much faster in a virtual environment as compared to the ones that we have to gather, right? In order to do things, we have to spend time, energy. There's not much time that we can allocate for doing tasks and repeating themselves. Even the most obsessed person which plays Go, who plays Go all the time will have to go and eat and pee, okay, right? So we are biologically constrained. Machines aren't on that side. We have some advantages from our millions of years of evolution back. Machines don't have, right? So I see them more, more than a, than a opposition. I see more as a continuum on, on a sort of very large dimension of space of abilities. But that's my view. So everybody is entitled to his, his own. Uh, my question is about what we said earlier. Actually, can a machine have the concept of deceive an opponent? Or in general, how can their tactics in a game be related to okay, so, yeah. events? Because yeah, we... I, got, I got So sorry. So th the notion of deception is a, is a moral notion, right? So you're deceiving someone in the sense that you are tricking her or him into believing something, okay? So this is something which concerns ethics. And again, the question, the larger question is, can machine have an ethical behavior? So I say, okay, I, I could play this move, but this move is actually deceiving. So I wouldn't play it. I would refrain from doing this. Or I want to do it because I want to deceive. So the notion that you want to do, you want to do this because you want to deceive is something that might be available to machines, but we don't know. No, I, I'm not. I'm not thinking in a moral way. I'm thinking more in a tactical way. Like, for example, when I say deception, I mean setting in-game traps, like make the opponent believe. Because if you are a player of any game and you know that your opponent is human and thus is fallible, you may trick him. You may trick him into think that. So it's not deception. It's manipulation. It's making the opponent think what you want him to think, and then exploit this thing, like making a trap in chess and waiting for the opponent to fall in it. How whatever, can he construct whatever works, a trap? Whatever works. I'm not sure that, so since AlphaGo Zero is playing against itself, okay? So what it learns from the game, it's already shared with the opponent. So they're always on the same footage. So I, I'm reluctant to think that it, it leans on the fact that the other player has some weak points because the same weak points of the other player are his own, its own weak points. So this kind of shared information between the two opponents makes it, for me, more difficult to believe that it's using this strategy deliberately to take advantage of uh, some, some weak point of the opponent. But again, I don't know. Can I? I don't know if this is a rather existential question, so maybe it's not the right time to ask it, but I would like to ask, we have seen that these machines are capable of outperforming in tasks which require planning or forecasts or, in general, logic reasoning. I would like to know, do we know, and if we do, what have we done in this direction if these machines are actually capable of doing purely creative processes, like, I don't know, drawing a painting, composing a, a music piece, or writing, a, actually, now that I think so, of it, writing a poem, I have seen a... But, but also the painting and also the music. Okay, perfect. <laughs> so the answer, the short answer to these questions is yes, yes, yes. So they do this. The, the more interesting question is, again, when you define creative, you have to define creativity somehow for us humans. So if creativity is essentially a combinatorial exercise in which you see many things are different and then you say, okay, but this, if I combine this with that, then something new emerges. So if you, if you feel like, and then many scientists think like this way, that think that most of their creativity comes from having a vast knowledge and seeing connections between things that appear to be distant or seeking this connection. If you allow for this definition of creativity, then machines can be creative. Again, this is my viewpoint. But if you might talk with other people. I've been talking with audiences with, which are very diverse, and there were artists, and there were senior, more senior people, and they say, no, 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 creativity is something different, something that pops out of nowhere. 
right? And then you ask a question, it's popping out of nowhere because you just cannot follow the process by which it's being created or it's really something new? I don't know the answer. I mean, might well be that we do something which is totally, it really there is a gap, a substantial gap between doing simple combinatorics and exploring possibilities and combining things and creating something really out of nothing. I don't know how, how it works. My, my view is that, yeah, creativity is one form of very uh, smart exploration and the uh, ability of connecting things and uh, having large views and is accrued by large knowledge. But I might be wrong. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is the machine aware of who he is playing with? Uh, I mean, sorry, sorry. Can you start, start over again? Is the machine aware of the opponent who who he is, he is playing with? Uh, will he know if the opponent has changed? Because perhaps he could find some weak spots in person. If it plays with me, he will know I'm a beginner and just uh, try to win very fast. Um, so there are, there are so many levels to this question. So. <laughs> uh, so on one level, you might ask the question, OK, is, is the machine able to detect whether it's, it's playing against a human or against a, another AlphaGo zero, right? So this also borders on the Turing test and all problems or whether you can decide whether there is a machine or, uh, or a human on the other end of the line. Of course, very difficult, opens up lots of questions. I'm not going to address them all, but there's a clear path of references you can look into. And there is another question that, is the machine building up a model of what the opponent does, okay? Building a sort of theory of mind of what the opponent is doing. I don't know if these algorithms do. There is no theoretical obstacle to machines doing this. We will discuss this, how to build models of the environment and use them for improving learning and ability. So the answer is, uh, again, I don't know from a yes or no, depending on what kind of generality you, you, you're seeking in your question. Yeah, I'm going to take the last question because we have several other things actually to go through. Yeah. OK, uh, is the way that the machine learns is deterministic? So if I have two alpha goals, programs or machines, uh, will they play always the same style when they learn from themselves how to play? Will they play always the same style? In yeah, yeah. So. Or it, can any yeah. um, different styles can be emerged? Yeah, there, there, be some, there, there can be some convergence, right? Uh, you can try and avoid this kind of pitfalls of convergence to some uh, uh, specialized behavior, which would then be predictable by adding some exploration. So there's, there are ways of, uh, so it's, it's good if you converge to something because you want to converge to something that plays well or best, right? But you also don't know what best is really best. So you want to also allow for experimentation. So this way of sort of balancing the things of getting all your knowledge into something that you're able to play well and also allowing room for other experiences and changing and being unpredictable is something which is very important in learning and we'll discuss. I hope this answers the question. Very, very, very last question. Pass on the microphone because they were being recorded so... Start over again, please. For, for, for two same party, is the outcome the same? I mean, given an initial configuration or first, uh, uh, how do you say that? Yeah, so. Yeah, uh, may I just, uh, so. Especially in presence of incomplete information, which is the general setup, in which you don't have perfect control of all configurations of your game or, uh, uh, or task, uh, it often turns out that the best policy is not deterministic. So there will be inherent randomness in what you do, okay, just based on the fact that your knowledge is incomplete. So it, I, I think this answers the question. Okay, thank you very much. It was very, very interesting and helpful. If you have further questions and want to discuss, first among you, that's, that's the purpose of the whole thing, and then eventually with me, uh, I'm of course very happy to follow up. Now we see Another sequence of videos from a different realm. And we go through the same exercise again, right? We see the videos, we gather together, then in five minutes, discussion. And of course, many of the themes we already been discussed, so we have just to discuss what is difference, 
with what we've seen previously, okay, what are the new questions that emerge, and what kind of curiosities arise from, uh, from you seeing this. And this is the next one. Just another small clip, again from Boston Dynamics. Okay, fine. So again, gathering groups as before, five minutes for discussion, coming up with questions. Uh,
Okay. Can we can we start over again? Please everybody be seated. Okay. Shall we shall we start again with a uh, with a round of comments, impressions? Let's start from here. Anyone else wants to? Well, I mean, okay. 
So, yeah, um, two words really come into mind when just I saw a sec, that. Just a sec, please. Those two words being mass unemployment. <laughs> so. <laughs> well, I don't think so, but that, that's a subject for the, uh, the other yeah, yeah. meeting, right? Sure. Uh, yeah, so but let's address it just for a second. And, I mean, so mass unemployment, where does that really come from? So the combination of, say, the learning techniques that we saw before with the hardware, you know, how possible could that be? Where could that take us? You know. Yeah, so that, that's a concern. That's a real concern. It, uh, in the, you, can, you can keep your hands down. We'll just move around in a second. Uh, so that, that's a real concern, how this will impact our societal structure, uh, how the work will be transformed or erased. Okay, there are many, many interesting issues. Nobody knows the answer yet. There are many, many suggestions in how to proceed. So this is certainly something that's very important. Very interesting, very timely to discuss, especially for your generation, right? Uh, so again, if we want to meet some other time and discuss all these issues, I would be more than happy to, to learn from you. How do you feel about that, especially? And then I can tell you the, what the old professor thinks about it, okay? Mm -hmm. any, any other comment specific to this? Is that, what's the difference between what we've seen before? So is there a difference? I would say that what we saw with just now is almost less surprising, right? I don't know. Am I the only one who feels this way? Yeah. Well, okay. Let, let's let's have a poll. Who's surprised from from what they've seen? Surprise. Okay. Let, let, okay. Let's let's remove the sort of. Uh, Emotional part for the moment. Let's just think about surprisal, like I measured in bits. Okay, <laughs> okay. Uh, who was surprised by what they've seen? Okay. So you you are surprised or unsurprised, depending on whether they use live deep learning or not, and then and then get. Just, just one, one at a time, sorry, I, I, I can hear you. Can you pass on the microphone so that... I don't know nothing about this, but it depends on which way the rules given to the robots. Like no, but the question were, is another. Were you surprised? Yeah, and from that depends if I'm surprised or not. Like, okay. if you told them you have to keep your center of mass in the middle and do everything we do to move, then... Is that, a, is that the way you walk? No, I don't is know. That you, is that the way you work on snow? But By, okay, I have to keep my body mass balanced. <laughs> That's exactly the kind of thing that people have been doing for 60 years now, because these robots, working robots, have been around for 60 years, and in the last 59 years, they've been failing miserably, because they tried to control every step. But actually, people finally realize that when you walk, when you walk down a slope, when you walk down a chair, what you're actually doing is you're falling. You're falling in the least controlled way, okay? So people now being devoting a lot of research into least controlled algorithms in order to achieve tasks which are such natural to us, such as walking down a slope, etc. okay? So it is surprising or not surprising depending on whether you've seen a clip of this kind of robots walking on snow six months ago and basically rolling all over the way hundreds of times, okay? So, well, I'm taking your, your answer right, for what it is. You, 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 your degree of surprise depends on how this thing is done. That's what you're saying, okay? Can we have another? Yeah, uh, okay, I just, uh, I want, to ask about the algorithm and how it is doing it. Because first we saw uh, AlphaGo learning how to play Go, but in this case, these machines are learning how to move, or it's only in the hardware, like the hardware tries to, to be the most efficient in order to okay. to move and how. Yeah, so this, this points to, to one big difference between what we've seen before and what we have seen later, is that these are physical machines. They have to interact with the real world, okay? So they have 
actuators. There's a lot of engineering in how to build feet or something we avoid to slide or a handle, right? There's a lot of technology, if you wish, in creating a, a physical interface between the machine and the world, right? Whereas the first, the other case was totally abstract. It was just an algorithm proposing moves. So the only way it interacted with the environment was just by sending out bits. Whereas here, there is a physical interaction with the environment. And it's an environment which is wildly more variable than the environment of another Go opponent. Okay? Lisa Doll will never stand up and start punching in the face of the machine. Okay? Whereas this can happen in the real world when you interact physically with an opponent, like in this case, or just because the environment is hostile. Think about stepping on the snow. You don't know. There might be just one hole in front of you, and then you just fall over there. Everybody, I would think, sorry, I'm, now I'm, I'm talking as a, as a Westerner, sorry. Most of you might have experienced what, what it is to walk in the snow down the slope, okay? If you haven't, you might have other experiences of how it is to walk in, in very unpredictable situations, right? Which might be different from snow. Sorry for this horrible whitewashing of, of the problem. <laughs> okay, so... Um, yeah. There was a lot, a lot of training induced by it. It's not, it's not by crafting examples, right? Because as you've seen, they have been opposing to this in very different ways, which are not intuitively predictable by the robot. It's just that it's been sent to the ground, abused many, many times. And it takes a lot of time because, again, if when you have a physical interface rather than a, an algorithmic interface, like we said before, like animals, you have to recapitulate the ability of standing up from the ground in a short lapse time, which might be months or years, of what has been the result of a long evolution. Okay. Yeah, I have a question related to this uh, to this characteristic to be physical. So uh, in the in the AlphaGo Zero, you can um, Oh, I mean, this is reinforcement learning too. This is not supervised too, right? No, okay. it, it's in, for the robots, the, it, it's more complicated than this. There has been an issue of supervision, supervision because, again... It, okay. So but it's not, it's not just that they put the robot in an arena and then <laughs> let them kill themselves yeah. until they are able to stand up and yeah. move. So it's different because you, you, can, you don't have the yeah. Yeah, time course. allowance for this. But the, the last part is, is, is again... Largely reinforced. Yeah, because you can yeah. you cannot train them uh, digitally, and then uh, you cannot train them only digitally, uh, simulating an environment because you cannot uh, reproduce the complexity, exactly. right? So, is it a fact that the time you need to train these uh, f actual physical uh, machines are? Uh, yeah, is is it an issue? The fact that the physical machines need to move actually in the I mean, in one minute, you, you cannot do a million of trials. Yeah, of course. Like for uh, digital, so but... They, uh, they clearly, their ability to generalize... Th these machines are very good at generalizing, in general. Okay, it's okay. starting from a relatively small sub subset of experiences to sort of extrapolate on how to do in, in new... That, that's, a, that's a key secret, right? And when you're able to do this, you, you, you do well. At least you survive. Uh, but they, they, there are limits to this, right? AlphaGo wouldn't be able to drive a robot, and the robot wouldn't be able to play yeah. Go at no level, right? <laughs> but probably a lot of difficulty even in moving yes. the pieces on the chessboard without just fumbling everything around, okay? Yeah. So still we are talking about artificial intelligence systems which do very well on a relatively narrow task. No, I mean, uh, the question was, even in, in the narrow task, task that just needs to, to be reproduced digitally, you can, uh, I mean, in three days, the, the AlphaGo Zero can reach the top level. I, I don't know the figures, but perhaps Matteo knows. There are cases in which, for example, OpenAI they are trying to train robots to do the same digital environments. They are trying to recreate these digital environments in which they can. They can try to to let the robot learn and then transfer what they learn in the computer, in the software, inside the, the physical robot. Yeah. But this is very, very, very difficult, and it 
I think it just, I'm not an expert, of course, but it's just at the beginning. Yeah, this is also one way, virtual reality, using virtual reality to, to boost the ability of, uh, of learning. And another thing that was very important, I don't have an example, but it's also very important in development of uh, uh, AI, is video, video gaming, okay? So there's a whole branch of research of DeepMind which extensively teaches or allows uh, artificial intelligence systems to play video games which have a variety of experiences which is, starts to be comparable to human experience. Even though in that case there is no physical interface, so there's again this added layer of engineering which is also very important. Things have to exist. Uh, I think that um, in the case of the robots, uh, n uh, w what we saw uh, was that uh, nobody can stop them. Yes, and th they continue to, to uh, reach the goal. But yes. in, in the first case, the case of the Go, the machine can, may lose. So uh, robots can <laughs> uh, do much better. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so that, that's very important. If, it, if a machine learns well, well, determination is something that doesn't lack, right? So it's very important to shape the objectives of machines, especially when they interact with us. As long as it's a computer, you might always think about taking the switch off, which is not easy in general, okay? Because they might learn when you are wanting to do this and prevent this, okay? But see, this is a, some sort of open questions in AI, how to make interruptible machines. Are there a way of designing algorithms which are always interruptible? No matter what, what they learn about you, about how you act, they, you can always have a handle, a back, uh, a back door to, to, to shut them, okay? And this was one side of, of the thing. And then the other side is the, exactly the problem of correct alignment of goals, objectives. You have to specify clearly your objectives. You have to think about artificial intelligence, machine, robots, next generation, not the ones that we have now, such as the genie, the genie of the tales, right? You have three desires. Then you know you have to be very careful in asking because you will get for what you ask. You know, you will not get what you thought you'd be getting, okay? So in artificial intelligence, it's very important shaping right rewards, correct rewards which reflect your knowledge. There are many interesting discussions in philosophy. So for instance, if you, if you say, I want to build a machine that, this is a classic example now in, uh, in artificial intelligence, which builds paper clips, okay? So the objects that you use to clip paper. And this machine, it just told, told this, be the best producer of paper clips. And then you can imagine a runaway scenario in which this machine just starts confiscating all the metal from the world and building paper, and everybody will be submerged of paper clips, okay? There will be nobody else uh, being able to build a, a tractor or to work in the, in the fields or, uh, or cell phones, etc. because the machine is taking over. What, what's lacking to this machine? Common sense. And you say, okay, listen, I said, good, very good, excellent. So my, as much as I can get a, a nice uh, house and a big building and I'm gonna be rich out of paper clips, but I didn't mean that. No, but that's what you asked for, okay? So this is a very important in shaping objectives. Uh, just a remark. The most sophisticated robots are performing their task according to coordinates. But uh, humans evolved another way to perform their task. I don't know, I don't, uh, know uh, the specific way, but it's not relied on coordinates. So what I wanted to say is, uh, despite performing the, so the same tasks, they are uh, seeing the words differently. Yeah, that's very good. So this is another aspect, okay, which is very important, and we'll discuss them talking from tomorrow. So any agent which works in the physical world, okay, it's, it's, it's also true for algorithms in general, but it's less obvious. But for robots, it's more clear. There are two interfaces with the world. One is the actuator, okay, in how the agent does things in the world. The way that legs are built, if it's four-legged, two-legged, if it has a sort of 
uh, way to handle things if it's a hand or something different. This is the actuator part. But there's another part which is equally important, is the sensor part. All these robots add, add cameras, okay? Self-driving cars have lasers. So this is the sensor part. This is an interface which receives information from the environment. And the actuator part, after processing of this, whatever that does between, brain, algorithm, whatever, then produces outcomes, which are actions which impact on the world, do things, okay? So it's equally important to have very good sensing in a way that is, might be peculiar to machine, different from humans, like uh, you said, and having actuating, which might be, again, similar to what humans do. So humans and animals might be a source of inspiration, but we don't have to just keep our eyes shut. You see, the machine that was opening the, opening the door, robot opening the door, did not have a hand. It is something, a different clamp, which was very well serving the purpose. But perhaps if it was to order two beers, that, that would be different, right? Okay, more difficult. Uh, the actual design of robot is right now subjected to what is a human see of the world. You know, we build a handle, we build, having in mind maybe animals, imitations of nature, and stuff like that. But what I'm thinking is, couldn't be devised an algorithm for self-evolution? What I mean is, for example, a machine can, in its lifespan, can learn what is its environment, and then it could be allowed to better select the next, the components for the next generation of machines. And so, in a, se in a certain sense, how to improve itself is like artificial selection. Yeah, it yeah, is sure. itself. So, so uh, again, there are so many layers in this question that it's difficult to unravel them all. So this idea of self-constructing machines dates back to von Neumann to the 40s, okay? Is something that's been around. more than self constructing, self projecting. Yeah, and then they also construct themselves, right? Or they send the project to, the, to a firm somewhere. <laughs> this okay. Let me have this right. to Amazon. Okay, please ship me this. <laughs> okay, uh, so all these things have, have, been, have been around, and actually, you can think about exploring. The, the problem with evolution is that it's slow. The big difference between all the things that all the behavior that you we see here, okay could be achieved by a very different way of learning, which is just evolution and genetic algorithms. These are entirely different class. Because there you just do things and a posteriori evaluate. It's been going good or bad, and then you clamp down your population and you replicate. Here, the algorithms, reinforcement learning, has a totally different point of view. You experience, you improve, you have a goal, right? So if you have some biology class, you obviously say, oh, Remember, evolution is not directed towards a goal. It's just variation and selection, variation and selection. Okay? So this is very different in spirit. So in principle, it could work. On computer, it could do something, perhaps. Depending on computer power, one, one way of learning might be better than other. But we don't discuss this kind of selection evolution scenario. Okay? Hope this is clear. If not, I can expand further. Any other comment? Hello. So when you started uh, those clips, and uh, I thought the problem is about sensing and uh, sensing the changes in the environment and readjusting your uh, decisions accordingly. But you said in the first statement that it's not that. It's not like adjusting your center of mass or something like that. It's more giving less control to your things. So, can you explain so, that? Yeah. I, I want to. Let me expand on this. Uh, let's not think about robots. Let's think about ourselves. So who can ride a bike? Good. Okay. So when you learn how to ride a bike, do you exert some specific control? Do you obey some certain set of rules? Or just at some point you find the sweet spot and you're able to ride? We try not to fall. You try not to fall, right. So that's certainly a punishment that comes in the end. But when you've fallen down, do you really know? Can you trace back what kind of actions you did that were good or, or not? And you said, OK, I should adjust my center of mass in that way when I was in that curve. Is that, is that the way you learn? We do try to 
keep ourselves balanced in the center mm. by adjusting our handles. Okay, like. then we have, must have a ride together and, <laughs> and see how you perform. <laughs> No, actually, it's a, it's a very it's very much of a shortcut what happens in your brain when you when you learn to to ride a bike. You just you feel your body is doing these things and then you act reflexively. You don't have time to to process the information, etc. So what I want to say was was more in that sense is that it's a very complex way that in which these kind of robots, these new robots, sense the environment, process the information in a way that doesn't rely at all on even simple calculations like uh, Newton's law, right? So that's there's no physics knowledge there, such as there's no physics knowledge in every toddler who, who tries to, to, to walk for the first time, right? So it's, it's, it's a very practical and non-intellectual way of... But then what does it try to do? Uh, I don't know. It's, it works. Again, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say like this. Like, I don't know, actually, what AlphaGo thinks when, when it plans. Where does it want to go with this move? I have no idea. It's not looking into a table and say, okay, he's playing the, the famous game between uh, uh, Master X and Master Y uh, played in the 1967 uh, in Shanghai. I don't know. Okay? It's not doing like that. It's doing just like he has some recollection of experience collected in different ways, merged together in a way that we don't know. We don't understand. We don't have the same experience. And the same, these robots, they, they could, you couldn't possibly decode all the sequence of individual actions, because it's a, it's a whole. Just a second, so the microphone moves. But you know, we have something uh, which is already called consciousness and unconsciousness. So when we first learn to drive a car, we care to look, OK, it's, if it is not automatic. When, for example, changing gear, it is one, then two, then three, for example. So at first, we care about what we're doing. But after a while, we, then we are learned, for example. We know what we are doing, so we do it unconsciously. Uh, I'm not sure if these two terms are still valid in the sense of machine learning or artificial intelligence, but uh, I think his question can be somehow translated in this way that, okay, uh, everything which is happening uh, by machine maybe is uh, different rather than doing us. Maybe there is no difference between consciousness and unconsciousness. Maybe we should rephrase these things and maybe we change our minds about how human even learn, so. Yeah, so again, this is, these are very deep questions. Uh, I think that the line is very blurred between conscious, unconscious, machine, uh, human, uh, animal. But again, that's my own opinion, which is just as worth as yours, okay? So, but these are definitely, I think, very, very interesting questions in general. The, Beside the fact that we are uniting here to learn how these algorithms do and what they have to do with statistical physics or et cetera. Okay? Any other comment or question? Okay, if not, we go to the final clip, which again is a, this one is a bit longer. So the, the goal of this clip is actually twofold, so I'm anticipating a little bit. First, we move away from machines. We also moved back in time, so this was 70 years ago. Because this is the aim to show that even if these things are very recent, very new, etc., the ideas uh, have been there for roughly a century. Okay? And this is very useful and interesting because you have to, to have a, a historical perspective of how things evolve. And it will also allow, our, allow us to understand better at least a very qualitative level, the level of conversation, what, what's the relationship between what we do in artificial intelligence now and what we have learned about animal behavior over the years. And the two things talk to each other very much. So this is the clip. Notice that it's Institute of Human Relations. And these are two humans. We 
can't, I cannot hear the, sorry, I can't hear the, the audio. It's going to be long without the audio. From the booth, do you have any audio coming? Ciao, non sento più audio dal video. Adesso ho fatto ripartire un video, non c'è più audio. Puoi controllare, per favore? Ah. We'll try and fix this in a second. Ah, probably that's, that's fine. No rest. Oh. Oh, okay. What do you think is the reason that's for fine. the difference Thanks. in their oh. behavior? The animal on the left is hungry. The one on the right, with the food in his cage, is satiated. This is hungry, this How is satiated. How will this difference in drive okay. affect their... In order to see whether the difference in drive will produce a difference in learning, we're going to use an apparatus with two identical compartments. One for the animal that is very hungry... And another for the animal that is not hungry. Very hungry on the left, not hungry, satiated on the right. At the outside end of each compartment is a food delivery apparatus. This consists of a stirrup-shaped bar placed above a food dish. Pressing the bar delivers a small pellet of food into the dish immediately below. Okay, you press the bar, then a small pellet of food falls into the small container. Then they take the, the mice and, and put them into their respective uh, We will now cages. put the hungry and the satiated animals into the apparatus and watch for differences in learning. After being put in an unfamiliar environment, both animals are active. But the hungry animal is somewhat more active. Okay, so they don't know the place first time that they visit this cage, so they look around. The very hungry one is more active than the not hungry one, by some measure. Okay. It will become more the hungry animal remains active, but as the satiated one becomes adapted to the new environment, he settles down and becomes inactive. Okay. So there's no problem around. My belly is filled. Take a nap. Watch the wide variety of responses which the hungry animal makes. Yeah, this is a lot of smelling and sniffing, so when, when rats are like this, they smell a lot. Mice or rat, I don't actually know. But... So all these behavior experiments started in the 20s, the work of Skinner. Since each Skinner of these responses features, occurs without reward, it is soon displaced by a new response. The behavior is variable. Okay, there's still a lot, a lot of exploration and sniffing and looking around. Apparently no food here. What responses do you think the other rat is making? The satiated rat is inactive. But even if he had hit the bar and got a pellet, food would not be a reward without the drive of hunger. The hungry rat is active. He stands up near the bar, but just misses it. The correct response of pressing the bar cannot be rewarded and learned until it occurs.
He approaches the food device, stands up near the bar, presses it, but since he does not see the pellet and the food cup, he is not rewarded. He's now he finds the pellet so and is works. rewarded for approaching the food cup. From now on, he confines more of his activity to the region of the food dish. Okay, so this is one interesting step. And I'm stopping just a second to, to clarify this. So it went up, pressed on the bar. So the pellet fell, but he didn't see the pellet in the, in the box. So he just moved away. So there was no association between the action of pressing and the reward coming from the box. But later on, he just got to the box and said, oh, there's food there. So in that case, there was reinforcement for staying around that area, but not yet for performing the correct action, okay? Let's resume this. is off again, is it? Or... No, it's okay. It's just that. At last he hits the bar and gets an immediate reward. Has he learned? Will it take him as long to press the bar the next time? Although the animal still makes quite a few irrelevant responses, he presses the bar much sooner the second time. The occurrence of a single reward has strengthened the tendency to make the response of pressing the bar. Notice that the rat performs a... Just a sec. So, the first time that he does this, he makes this association, okay? Again, this is something which is peculiar to animals. Machines wouldn't learn so fast on first shot, okay? Animals, babies, often display this single shot learning, which is probably a combination of genetic abilities, or inherited abilities, and learning, right? So this is something that in a pure learning from scratch in machines doesn't happen. You have to repeat these things many, many times before establishing the association, okay? Exactly the same response which was rewarded. Now, is there room for improvement? Would you, would you just put your In the next in trial, you will this? see that is, is coming this, up to the bar from a slightly different angle, the rat makes a new response. He goes around the side of the stirrup instead of down through it. So by chance, it discovers that going by the other side, you can have the same he thing He goes without... back to his old response. Not so smart. He still makes a few irrelevant responses. No. Watch him go around so the side of the bar things. again. Is being this response gradually wins days. out because it is rewarded the fastest and with the least effort. But that's true. In general, if there's habituation, the rewards become less and less interesting. There's less motivation, right? So there are two things, motivation and reward. On the next trial, you'll see that the animal starts down to the food dish before he has pressed the bar hard enough to get a pellet. He makes several anticipatory errors which are not rewarded and regresses to his old response of diving through the stirrup. So he's been pressing a couple of times, but it was not just hard enough. So he goes, oh, it doesn't work. These anticipatory the errors occur for a number of trials then and then are gradually eliminated. It eliminates this part because that was sort of, the reward was partially diluted by the fact that he had to choke itself to the ring. Okay, then uh, 
the movie goes on and shows another experiment which by no means would be possible nowadays. <laughs> so you might find this a little bit disturbing. <laughs> so this is an experiment with punishment. Essentially, there's, a, there's an electric grid and there's a voltage applied. With this device, we can put a mild electric bottom. shock on the grid on which the rat stands. The shock is adjusted to be annoying, but not painful. Okay. So there's a, they're going to put a, an electric wiring at the bottom of the cage. And they say, we're going to modulate the voltage so that it's just annoying and not harming. Okay. So that, that's the experimenter that says that, of course. Um, and then you will see the response of the rat, which doesn't seem to be simply annoyed. Uh, and the idea is that if they press the bar, now it, this will stop the current from flowing in, into the wiring, so they will stop the, the bad sensation. It will interrupt the punishment, okay? Shock is on. Shock is off. Pressing the stirrup bar, turns off the shock. Although the shock is not strong, you will see that it supplies enough drive to produce a radical change in the behavior of the satiated rat. He hits the bar, the shock goes off, and he's rewarded. He's clinging to that for his life. Now here the point is to show that even if the... He hits the bar and is rewarded again. Even if it's a satiated rat, it is provided a stimulus which elicits motivation. After a few more trials, risk. which are not shown in the picture, he has learned to press the bar quickly as soon as the shock goes on. Okay, fine. Good enough for our sadistic uh, show. Uh, last session, three minutes discussion. What do you think about it? What's the connection with the other things? Does it have anything to do? Okay, I gave you some background already. Three minutes, it's very short.